Thank you. So, so welcome everyone for joining. Uh, I know that's still more and more uh, audience are coming in. And um, so today we're really happy to have uh, Yastu, who's uh, the VP of engineering and head of data science team and LinkedIn to uh, talk to us about LinkedIn data science, um, how to creating a global economic opportunity. Uh, so really excited to have her uh, joining us today. And uh, so this is a remote seminar and uh, we're using pretty standard uh, timing. So uh, yeah, we'll take uh, most of the time uh, to, to talk about what's happening, uh, all the exciting things happening at, at, uh, at LinkedIn. And then we'll, we'll also have some time after the talk uh, for Q&A. Um, so for if you have questions uh, for Yasu, so please write them in the uh, Q&A uh, panel uh, there. And then uh, there's upvote, downvote, so you can do that too. And then after the talk, um, so I will, I will help moderate the Q and A session, and then we can um, have a uh, uh, yeah have an interesting session with them. So, without further ado, I'm going to give the time to yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paulo. I just also wanted to mention that if you have any questions throughout the talk, uh, please feel free to start asking them as well in the Q and A panel, uh, and Paulo will also help uh, moderate. Uh, we can we can also take questions throughout the talk. So uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm super excited to be invited to this conversation today, uh, but I really do also wanted to start uh, just a little introduce, introduction of myself as well, just to get to know the audience a little bit more. Uh, I grew up in Chengdu, China, uh, and I was there pretty much until college, and I then went to Williams College on the East Coast of the United States, uh, got my degree in math and economics before I moved to San Francisco Bay Area and got my PhD in statistics at Stanford. After that, I made a move to uh, Seattle, spent a couple of years uh, there with Microsoft uh, before I came uh, back to the Bay Area and joined LinkedIn. And certainly for those of you who are familiar, you know that LinkedIn now is part of Microsoft. So uh, essentially, I, uh, you know, I, I wanna say that I pretty much only worked at one company then since I graduated, that is um, Microsoft. Um, so on the personal front, uh, I uh, also I uh, I have two kids. Uh, we we live in the Silicon Valley. Uh, I love uh, growing my own vegetables. Uh, well, my husband is the one who does the work, and I get enjoying the fruits. I guess. Uh, uh, just a few years back, two three three four years back, I also started to really uh, like to skiing, um, um, primarily because I my kids got really into it and I wanted to stay ahead of them. Um, and we also really enjoying, uh, obviously, uh, be spending time on the beach as well. A big benefit of being in California is on one weekend we could be skiing, on the other weekend we could be on the beach enjoying uh, in the wonderful weather um, as well. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's actually get to the topic of today. So we're gonna, uh, Obviously, I wanted to uh, have a high-level introduction of LinkedIn, since not everyone here uh, probably are like, familiar with LinkedIn. And we're going, we're going to also talk a little bit of my team, uh, the data science team at LinkedIn. And then we're going to spend majority of the time today going to talk about a few topics uh, of the things, just, just highlighting a few things that we're doing um, uh, here in, in, as, as a data science team at LinkedIn. So uh, what is LinkedIn? Um, so at LinkedIn, we have this uh, vision to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And the reason that I wanted to actually start by sharing this vision is not because, you know, hey, this is just a slogan that we use or anything like that. It's actually really in, like entire LinkedIn community really embodies this vision. And it will come through as I talk about what we do here as LinkedIn as well. And you can see that. And then we have this, uh, what we call economic graph uh, that certainly has a lot of different entities on the graph ranging from members, uh, which is essentially uh, users of LinkedIn who are uh, who, who sign up our account with us. And then we have members, we have uh, different companies who also have their company pages on LinkedIn. We have jobs and then skills, schools, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you can see that there is a LinkedIn community is really organized as various different entities representing sort of the entities on the economic graph and also the connections between them, right? So there's a very vibrant uh, community across the board where uh, members talk with each other, companies talk to the members, and then people obviously apply for jobs and, and the students working uh, and participating in different schools. Uh, you know, this is where uh, I think a lot of uh, folks who already know LinkedIn may actually not know the, the various different business that we have at LinkedIn. So uh, you may be familiar with uh, our 
uh, talent solution business, which is really think about if you use LinkedIn and you get emails from a recruiter, recruiters can contact you, uh, or you as a job seeker, maybe go on LinkedIn and try to look for jobs. That is just like one of the five um, uh, business that we have, right? That is sort of like, you know, our recruiter and our jobs business. And then we have like four more other areas. I'm just gonna be very quickly touch upon them. Uh, the second, uh, line of business that we have is a sponsored jobs, uh, sponsored ads business, right? So now imagine that you are an advertiser, you want to be able to reach different audiences on LinkedIn, and then so you essentially uh, create an ads with LinkedIn that we can show um, uh, in together with some other organic content that we have in the feed, right? So if you uh, use your know, member of LinkedIn, you go to your feed, you will see a combination of uh, maybe posts by your network and also at the same time uh, the ads. Uh, that the, the advertisers share. And then we also uh, have our uh, sales solution business. Uh, this is actually primarily designed for a salesperson on LinkedIn who they can use LinkedIn to identify uh, the potential customers for themselves, right? Who they should be selling their products to. Uh, so that is our sales solution business. And then uh, we also have uh, a learning business uh, which is uh, actually started out uh, with our Linda acquisition a few years back, uh, where we actually, uh, f so, so, so Linda is essentially a learning platform where you can um, go have, like there's a lot of learning courses you can go and you can, you can learn different skills. We bought Linda a few years back and then I integrated uh, with our LinkedIn uh, solutions business um, that is our learning uh, uh, system. And obviously, you know, for, for learning, we uh, have, a uh, lot of enterprise customers and then like, you know, some, a lot of schools uh, are our customers as well that they, they subscribe uh, so that they can use the learning courses that LinkedIn offers. So uh, now uh, on to what is LinkedIn data science. So LinkedIn data science, uh, we have about 300 uh, data scientists across uh, uh, the globe. As you can see on the map, we have our biggest office is actually our Sunnyvale office. Um, in the Silicon Valley in, in, in California. In California. Um, and uh, then we have also a, a office in San Francisco. We have office in New York City. We have office also in Dublin, Ireland, and also in Bangalore. Um, and uh, we, you know, there are some smaller areas that we did not highlight here, but also we have like office in Singapore. We have uh, folks in Beijing, China uh, as well. Um, so, uh, obviously, for those of you who are in the audience today, you are uh, uh, one shape or form, uh, probably interested in data science uh, uh, as a field, just so you know, as a great news for all of you, like certainly a data science uh, as a skilled professional is, uh, we, we've seen a continuously uh, a, a growing demand um, from uh, different uh, not only from different geos, like I'm showing here, that the gap is growing in terms of U.S. alone, uh, but also in terms of different industries as well. There's certainly a lot more uh, folks with, with data that they wanted to make sure that they are able to get value out of data. So coming to LinkedIn Data Science, uh, we have this mission uh, of really maximize the power of data to benefit all of LinkedIn through science and engineering. So when I say all of LinkedIn, uh, I really you know, I think the next slide is gonna make it uh, really come to life, which is really, if you think about how uh, the data science team today work, uh, we are work uh, on uh, like, I wanna say pretty much every single domain that we have uh, as business, as product, uh, as infrastructure as well. So we have, uh, a, we have data scientists who work on advancing different part of our product uh, offerings, uh, both from the consumer product and also the, the different solutions that I mentioned earlier, um, as well, like a learning solution, recruiting uh, uh, and advertisements, et cetera, et cetera. We also work with very closely with our sales and marketing team as well, not only um, figuring out um, how we can make our go-to-market motion a lot more efficient, but also understanding uh, how we should be investing uh, in, in, those, in those sales and marketing space. Um, and, you know, we, not, not, again, not only just, you know, product and business, we also very much involved in our infrastructure, our platform as well, figuring out, uh, answering questions such as, uh, how can we even run our Hadoop job efficiently? How can we optimize our Hadoop job such that we can utilize less uh, uh, computation resources, as an example? 
And most importantly, we also have a couple of functions uh, within the team that's really primarily focusing on a lot more horizontal effort. Uh, what, what are the, the key uh, research areas that we should be focusing on that is going to be benefiting all data science teams uh, across across all these different spaces that I mentioned? And uh, how can we, what are the tools and platforms that we should be building such that we are uh, increasing continuously the productivity um, of the team across the board? So uh, going a little um, uh, bit more, uh, starting with uh, obviously uh, the, the people are the most important uh, of the team. Uh, you can see uh, that we have we are a very diverse team uh, with a, a pretty good spectrum of uh, education backgrounds. Uh, either that is their degrees uh, or the fields of their study, uh, right? Like we have folks who certainly. Uh, come, coming. I, I want to say majority of folks on my team probably have advanced degrees, but we certainly also have individuals who come in with a bachelor's degrees as well. Um, and when it comes to educational background, statistics uh, is probably the most popular, but not not uh, um, certainly not the only one. Uh, we have folks who come in with uh, computer science degrees and like math, economics started to gain a lot more popularity in the team as well, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we even have folks who come in with journalism uh, background. Uh, again, just speaks to the diverse set of uh, skills that the team has. And goes into uh, what it means uh, in terms of our daily work. I wanna say again, a very diverse set of things that team does. Uh, there are individuals who are very much focusing on uh, taking our data and understanding it, producing the right insights that is able to drive the right actions, either that the actions being product that we're building or that is, uh, you know, decisions that we're making. Um, and then there are folks who also uh, taking a lot of this research insights and then build it into our platforms as well. That is their focus, right? For example, what is the, the, the platform that we should be building for experimentation, for anomaly detection, like, um, uh, uh, like even just like in terms of LinkedIn, as a product platform, what we should be building um, as part of it as well, and certainly uh, a lot of this uh, uh, is, is is you know in the innovation innovative space uh, that we are really pushing the boundary not only for the work at LinkedIn but leading the charge in the industry um, as well. And I will mention a couple of them as well in my in my deep dive topics. In terms of the technology stack that we're doing, we we use a combination of things that maybe some of you in the audience are familiar with that is open source that uh, is a common technology stack across and we also uh, utilize uh, some technology stack that LinkedIn uh, homegrown uh, as well things people here probably are familiar with are like Hadoop like Spark uh, we have open source Azkaban uh, as well um, but we certainly are Python uh, quite commonly used tools for us. Uh, and we, we certainly on top of it, we have built our own uh, uh, experimentation platform as one example. We have built our own um, causal inference um, platform. So we have built our own visualizations uh, that, uh, that, that sort of existing uh, external uh, solutions uh, cannot um, offer. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm going to go into the the biggest topic of today, which is really, I want to say, a combination of uh, uh, six uh, highlight spotlight topics I wanted to go over. Um, I deliberately, when I, when I was deciding uh, what I should be talking about um, to this audience, uh, I was debating whether I should just take one topic and go really deep. Or I want all going a little like sort of uh, uh, I want to say broad uh, and like this, the the breath going after the breath, and I decided that I, I would go the the, the breath way. Uh, the particular reason is because I really wanted to uh, take this opportunity to share with you a little bit more, uh, just getting you the flavor of the type of problems that we solve. Um, but uh, you know, if any of you are interested in to know. And like certain topics in particular, then we can provide more information on where you can find that more. Or I can, I'd be more than happy to also just connecting you with folks on my team who are able to walk you in a lot more depth on the work that they do as well. So these are the six topics uh, that hopefully offers you a, a good spectrum of the work that the team does. 
Uh, but let's uh, jump right in with the very first one on um, how we're measuring uh, network effect. So first of all, I wanted to share with you, like, what, what do we mean by network effect, right? So LinkedIn is a professional social network. So on the LinkedIn platform, you can connect with others. And then that connectivity, that connection, actually manifests in many, many different ways. And here, I'm just giving you this one simple example where Bill Gates uh, posted a, a shared a post on LinkedIn. Because how, because how many people are actually following Bill Gates on LinkedIn platform, or they are connected with him, and that single post can actually have a big impact on LinkedIn's ecosystem. Right, this one simple example of this one single post actually brought 2.6 million members to visit LinkedIn just so that they can read this uh, post. And we only talk about on day one, right? Like just imagine that how much impact that a single member, a single post, the effect that it can have. And the, the reason that they can have a, such a big impact is again, because of the network. So it's really important as we are thinking about uh, how can we measure uh, and, uh, our effects properly in the network, how can we understand cause and effect in the network, that we are able to measure those, not just from Bill Gates' standpoint, but I think from the network's uh, perspective. And so if I can go uh, a little uh, uh, concrete, another concrete example is thinking about messaging as well, right? So. Uh, Chenan here, like, you know, send a uh, message uh, to Jenny, and then that then triggers uh, multiple different communication channels, right? You can, you, you can uh, get an email notification, you can get an app push, you can get a badge, and then that essentially then help Jenny, who is on the receiver end of this, um, then, then come and then making sure that she does not miss that important communication from her friend. So, the way that we needed to do, uh, like when either that is uh, from our different product initiatives, so, sorry, uh, let's continue with that slide. <laughs> uh, so, so is to making sure that we can attribute properly of the effect that is happening downstream in the network properly back to uh, the, the sender of the message. The, the reason that we have to do proper attribution is because if there are initiative that is making the message initiator to make it a lot better experience for her, for her to then send a message to her network, then we wanted to make sure that we understand the effect from cause and effect standpoint, right? So we wanted to make sure that we both have the triggering and also have the right attribution. And not only that, we wanted to make sure that we are able to do that at LinkedIn scale, right? So we have like hundreds of millions uh, of, of messages sent every single week um, and, and then wanted to make sure that these are able to scale across the board. And again, I don't mean just messaging, right? You can think about as in if your friends on LinkedIn is posted something, Bill Gates posted something, you wanted to be able to know what is the impact of that post um, uh, at a scalable way uh, as well. So, um, so that is what one initiative that we try to do, we did uh, is essentially creating what we call camel uh, uh, solution um, Camel, by the way, it's 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 entirely a LinkedIn uh, terminology, uh, but is able to measure downstream impacts. And uh, at the same time, we also have other uh, ways that we are able to do that as well. Um, is we have uh, multiple different ways we make A/B testing uh, in the network setting a lot easier and simpler. Uh, here I'm I'm showing one of the many examples is what we call egocentric uh, experimental design. So if you imagine that you can take um, a, you know, for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, experimentation, A-B testing, you usually would take uh, all the entities in the graph and you randomize them into uh, treatment uh, or control. But uh, the egocentric experimental design is a lot, uh, is, you know, certainly, let's go back one a little bit, like in, in the way of like, you know, if we randomize um, without considering the network, there would be information that's leaked, like what we call like interference between treatment and control. So egocentric experimental design is really try to isolate um, that interference, right? So what we do is we say, hey, let's break down the graph 
into different clusters. Um, and then let's assign treatment and control labels depends on uh, what the cluster look like. Um, and then depending on the position uh, of the individuals uh, in the cluster, right? So that then is able to help us isolate uh, the impact from the experiment without worrying about the interference. And again, this is, a, I know this is a very deep topic. So a lot of uh, uh, papers that we have written on this space uh, and happy to share them um, afterwards uh, if you wanted to learn more about it. And the second topic I wanted to uh, chat about is how do we measure delayed effect? And here I'm going to give you a, a very concrete example. So I mentioned that LinkedIn, a lot of people use LinkedIn uh, to apply for jobs, to look for jobs, right? So think about um, as a job seeker uh, who uh, from the point when they start look for jobs or to apply for jobs to the point where they are actually get hired. That process can take weeks to months. So when we are building our product to make the job application process a lot better, to make the matching of job applicants to the companies a lot better. Like, like it's really difficult for us to wait for months in order to know, is this actually helping people getting a job or not? So in order to do that, the approach that we do is we actually saying, hey, why don't we, uh, next slide please, um, why don't we actually build a model that is able to take a lot of the signals uh, at the time when people apply for jobs, right? Either uh, we, we know that there is a lot of things that matters uh, to people, whether they are able to get the job or not, depending on uh, how many people apply for the job. So which is like, you know, application distribution. If there's a lot of people looking like who apply for the same job, obviously only one person can get it. So the chance of the applicants getting the job is gonna be small. And also, how good is the application quality? Is this applicant coming with the right skills uh, that the, the uh, companies are looking for? And which segment uh, is this job from? Certainly, uh, depending on whether this is like a uh, maybe industry, uh, like as different, different industries have different um, uh, hiring velocity and all of that. So we take all these signals together, and then we are able to, uh, based on the immediate signal when people apply for job, to be able to figure out whether this person um, uh, is going to be able to get hired or not. And then we are able to then use uh, this as what we call uh, a predictive uh, confirmed hire to estimate whether uh, any initiative that we do at the time when people are doing the, applying for job is actually helping our members or not, right? So uh, again, early indicators that is really able to help us predict to what the true north uh, of the what we really wanted to measure, which is, are we helping people getting jobs? And again, quickly switching uh, to the next uh, um, uh, is what we call budget split. And I'm gonna kind of uh, give a little uh, context on this because we, uh, we, uh, we are quite quickly switching <laughs> topics and I, maybe I should, uh, take a little slower. Uh, we talk about uh, one line of business that LinkedIn has is what we call this advertise, uh, advertiser business, um, uh, which is, you know, for those of you who are not familiar with this, so it's, imagine that you are a company and you say, hey, LinkedIn, I wanted to advertise on LinkedIn. Here is like $100, right? So now uh, coming to think about what's LinkedIn's job, right? LinkedIn's job is certainly uh, making sure that we are really able to deliver value as much as we, as like optimize the value that we're delivering, um, uh, both uh, from our members' perspective and also from our customers' perspective, right? So um, we wanted to make sure that the $100, the $100 that this advertiser is spending with us is well spent. So we do a lot of iterations on, on figuring out how we can do that. And again, a lot of it is done through a-B testing is done through experimentation. So now imagine uh, that you have uh, a um, ad campaign uh, that, um, you know, oh, like it's, it's, it's doing really well, right? So, you know, I have this hundred, I say, go and spend this hundred dollars on my behalf. And LinkedIn is already able to spend a hundred dollars like fully. 
but I have two different algorithms uh, that I can uh, uh, use to decide which ads to show, right? So in the treatment, um, in the treatment, the, ad, the, the algorithm is doing a lot better job of ranking more relevant jobs on the top of the feed. And then uh, so that members are like a lot more likely to engage with those ads. So they are uh, able to um, uh, you know, deliver revenue a lot faster. But I also have uh, my control group, which is the, the existing algorithm that may not be as effective as a treatment, um, as a treatment bucket. However, if, either way, the control bucket, even though that is not as effective at spending that money, the, like I mentioned, right, the, the, the ads campaign, it's already, we call this 100% budget utilized, is that they are already spending it. So end of the day, the real revenue that is coming from this better algorithm is actually zero, right? So we actually, we, we, we have $100 that we get from our advertisers and we spend it like all, oh, either that is entirely treatment bucket or entirely control bucket. However, in the traditional way of measuring uh, the impact in our A-B test, this would have told us that the treatment has a 100% more revenue. Uh, than control, precisely because that the budget, which I represents here as the green money, is actually there is budget constraint, right? So there's only a hundred dollars. It's it end of the day it becomes the treatment and control are actually like tug of war, right? They are trying to see who can spend the money faster, but it does not mean that we holistically is going to be able to spend money, spend more money. It's just that in terms of which one is spending faster or not. So. Um, this is a very common problem for pretty much any advertised um, um, uh, solutions. And we uh, we have tried several ways to solve this problem in the past. We have done uh, alternating day uh, A-B test, which is like, you know, um, maybe on uh, day one, we should give everybody treatment. On day two, we give everybody control. And then like, you know, we alternate. But one thing that we have found is that those approaches are a very, uh, uh, first of all, like they're not able to remove bias uh, in a good way. And second of all, is that they also uh, tend to be uh, not very sensitive, right? Because if you do using, as example of if you're using alternating day, the number of days becomes your sample size. So you really have very limited power uh, when you are doing that. So the way that we uh, found uh, a solution that we know that they have is what we call um, this budget split. So the concept of budget split is actually very simple, right? So you have advertise, uh, uh, you have different campaigns. And what you try to do is when you are randomizing on the consumer side, on the member side, you also at the same time splitting the budget as well. So treatment, you're essentially doing isolation of budget. So treatment has the treatment budget, control has the control budget so that they are not interfering with each other. So uh, a, a big lesson we learned for us uh, is that it turned out that the bias is actually uh, really high. And we, uh, we found uh, in many cases up to 70% uh, bias introduced in the traditional, in this classical um, way that we measure the impact. And then uh, uh, certainly we have a lot uh, higher power uh, if we do randomization. And, uh, at the consumer side, because we have um, uh, like uh, like millions uh, of data points versus um, and, you know in the alternating day approach, which is uh, very limited. So um, we the so going to the uh, next topic uh, on uh, forecasting. So it's certainly really important for us to have a good understanding of where um, uh, we stand uh, in, in, many, in many things that we do, right? Like so, so for our business, being able to forecast where our business will be, and even for our infrastructure, be able to forecasting um, uh, where uh, the, uh, how, how many uh, QPS, QPS stand for a query per second, how many QPS that our infrastructure, our, our data center are gonna get. Um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so having a very strong uh, forecasting system is really able to help us 
identify, uh, like knowing where we're expected to be, and then from there on, being able to then uh, I use our anomaly detection to highlight where sort of the large deviations are, and then finally be able to also having the right tooling to to diagnose uh, what goes wrong and what 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 doesn't. So zooming in a little bit more uh, on forecasting. Um, so, so we, uh, we certainly, like I mentioned, uh, we, we certainly have used forecasting, uh, in quite a different ways. I mentioned about capacity planning, uh, really about how much compute capacity, uh, is required in the next month, in the next year. Uh, we use it in performance management. This is really about like, hey, what is sort of the total revenue that we expected? Uh, are we on track? Right. Like, and especially that in some of the real time business, such as, the ads business, uh, do, are we, uh, are we, are we having enough, like the, the amount of revenue that we expect tomorrow, even my, from, from day to day. Um, and then most importantly, also like in terms of ecosystem understanding, like why, why is, why is today's revenue lower than we expected? So all these are very, uh, important aspects of forecasting, uh, that happens everywhere in the LinkedIn ecosystem. And, uh, we, we certainly, uh, uh, are building our algorithms uh, in a very dynamic way that is able to adjust to ecosystem changes. Like one simple example was uh, with COVID, uh, that actually changed our, um, uh, I would not change our model, but changed our predictions quite a lot uh, because that is all of a sudden changing the, 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 our customer and our member behaviors. So making sure that we have the right algorithm that is able to take those into consideration and certainly being having uh, accurate model, fast model uh, is very important. And also having an interpretable model um, that turns out to be quite important as well, because when when people are seeing uh, the numbers changing and the forecast changing, uh, what is driving that, right? So that, that goes into, uh, I mentioned earlier, I think our anomaly detection, um, like we, we needed to be able to get into the root cause um, of why uh, why things um, change the way they do. Um, going to the fairness topic, which is our next topic, uh, we, uh, we, we certainly fairness has started to become a, a quite important space. Uh, I want to say both, uh, not, not only for LinkedIn, for the industry, like, you know, I, I certainly have started to, I want to say like a few years back where, uh, quite a few groups in academia has also started to really focus on them. And it's really because it, it became more and more um, obvious to everyone that it's, it's something that collectively the community needs to address, right? Just as a, as a very simple example, um, if I'm just kind of taking a, a high level, uh, a, a sort of split um, of AI, talent, right? Folks who are working in the space of AI data science. And and you can clearly see that, and again, not just in the United States, across the globe, that the the uh, the gender uh, uh, disparity in this AI professional uh, is just growing uh, wider and wider. Like, and then, like, you know, we always talk about how AI is really becoming very important uh, for the society. And this gap is certainly uh, not a healthy gap for us to uh, to to sustain, right? We we gotta have to think about how we can break out of the loop. And similarly, if you if you're breaking the same thing but looking at it from different industry, the the same gender gap exists um, even for the industries that traditionally were very popular among female professionals, like let's say education and healthcare. That if you kind of do a, another segment within uh, those two industries that folks who work in AI uh, is also, um, uh, you know, the, the, the representation of female working AI is, is, is also very low uh, relative to all the other talent. So what are we doing about it? So, so we, um, I, uh, you know, we, we are certainly doing uh, quite a lot uh, in this space and try to um, uh, figure out how we as LinkedIn as a platform can help. I'm only going to be sharing uh, this one particular aspect, uh, which is uh, quite effective for us uh, to uh, to sort of uh, help um, uh, various different initiatives that we do across LinkedIn uh, to make sure that we are not introducing 
on the unintended consequences. So, so before I do that, I mean, let me kind of just like share a little very high level uh, what, what this means. So I mentioned uh, earlier of how uh, a lot of the, pretty much all the product changes that we do at LinkedIn actually go through A-B testing, go through experimentation. And the one thing that I, uh, I like maybe for folks who are familiar with experimentation, you would know the way that we're looking at them are primarily through uh, comparing averages, right? Like, you know, like is the treatment on average doing better than control? But that is, uh, uh, that is only a one aspect um, of what determines whether treatment is actually better than control, right? So if you're um, looking at this two ways uh, that the, a, the a initiative can actually impact uh, our members differently, there, there are two very different ways you can do this. Uh, one is uh, there are uh, you know, one treatment that is impacting uh, all members equally, right? So you can see that the average impact uh, is positive across the board. You can also see that there is another uh, treatment that is actually hurting a certain group of member, but it's actually helping uh, a, another group of member. So one thing we wanted to do is actually being able to um, identify not only on the average how things are doing, but are we actually introducing this um, uh, shifting uh, of uh, uh, values across our, our member, different member segments, right? So again, this is not only uh, in terms of the um, uh, jobs, that job applications, but also in terms of like other ways that a member can get value through LinkedIn. And we use this concept uh, that is actually quite uh, uh, a classical uh, inequality measurement in economics called Atkinson Index for us to do that. So, so then now you can say, hey, we now have a way of measuring uh, whether we are introducing uh, different values to different user segments, then how can we do that, right? So we, we are building, we have those building uh, to detect those unintended consequences in uh, all the product launches that we do, right? As in this simple example, as you can see, that we are measuring how many people, with, uh, how many people are uh, interacting with those job uh, notifications, and then not only that, we also measuring are we actually uh, seeing different kind of engagements uh, depending on um, whether uh, members are, uh, uh, you know, in the low social capital uh, categories or the high social capital uh, categories, um, and how we're doing that, right? So, uh, in in this particular example, uh, we actually found that by having uh, instant job notifications to the job seekers, we are actually able to decrease. Uh, engagement inequality among job seekers across the board. Um, so um, I know that we don't have too much time, uh, so I'm gonna quickly uh, go through the last topic, uh, which is really the data privacy. So we have all learned um, uh, to not give out information, right, because of uh, the the uh, to protect our privacy, uh, you know, don't, don't, we've always been told don't share your, uh, uh, don't share, you know, your personal information, like your address, your date of birth, your social security number, like, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing that is really important to highlight is um, it doesn't take all this sensitive information for somebody who has a bad intent to actually figure out who you are. Right, so like a very startling uh, number that uh, uh, that we have done, like not we, but like that's it's actually a research has done, um, was 87% of people who are in the United States, they can actually be uniquely identified by the combination of the date of birth, their gender, and their zip code, right? So you, again, um, very uh, 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 important that we really figure out how we can protect uh, the privacy of our members while we're utilizing the data, um, in particular from uh, some attacks that potentially can be out there, right? Like uh, that's like reconstruction attacks uh, or the difference in attacks. And so that's what uh, my, my uh, the, 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 the next few slides we're gonna go over is this uh, concept, um, and this field that we call differential privacy. At a high level, the, the concept of differential privacy uh, is very simple, right? Like I mentioned earlier, like 
you know, the, 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 there's many ways that like the reconstruction attacks uh, or differencing attacks that they can still apply if, um, even if you are anonymized data, right? Because all they need to know is your uh, date of birth, your, uh, your uh, gender and your zip code, things like that seems like pretty anonymized data that they're able to construct who you are. And then differential privacy on the other hand, is really saying that, hey, uh, we wanted to make sure whatever we can learn from the data should be the same with or without a single member's information. So as you can see, right, you, you learn the distribution from all this data, uh, all these uh, members and users that you have. And now they say, if you uh, remove data uh, of a particular member from the data set that you have, and the difference of the two distributions that you learn should be very, very small. Um, so, so mathematically, you can see that this is sort of a, a, a definition of differential privacy, really just says that whether you have um, uh, your, your, your two sets, X and X prime, um, that the, like what you can learn, which is you know, the, the, the distribution that you've learned should be the privacy that's lost should be very, very small, right? So uh, it's a well-defined uh, space. Uh, it's really now become more of a gold standard when it comes to data, data privacy protection because the, of the mathematical guarantee that you have. If you can satisfy differential privacy, then you are, uh, you are satisfied uh, with a very stringent uh, requirements. So how do we apply differential privacy on LinkedIn? Um, so we, uh, there are, you know, you can, you can see that there is at a high level, uh, there, there are a couple ways that you can apply differential privacy. One is when data goes from our members to our data centers, you can apply what's called local differential privacy model that essentially um, I, like making sure that there is the, the, the data is already uh, like privatized before it reaches our data center. You can also making sure that the, the, what we call global differential privacy model is making sure that when you then apply the data uh, and utilize in various different applications um, that you, you are not leaking information there as well. So um, we have done uh, quite a bit of work in this space. Um, and you know, when, when, when the, the thing that's really ex exciting for us is even though that there are uh, quite a bit of differential privacy algorithm that's there, uh, when it comes to uh, certain applications, um, it's got its limitations. Um, so which also means that, you know, we can go and do the right research to making sure that we are able to solve those problems properly. Uh, you, as an example, as we, we actually had a paper published in NIPS uh, last year, end of last year, uh, on this what we call top K algorithm. Uh, that is essentially try to estimate uh, what is the um, top 10 articles with the most comments, quest, like things like that, right? You wanted to have a, you wanted to have a query that is able to ask a data set some questions and then the query is, comes in the form of what is the top X uh, with these characteristics. Um, and certainly a lot harder problem than if you say, hey, I just wanted to um, make sure that um, there, you know, you add some uh, Laplace noise um, and on top of the, the data they return, right? It's just not, not just like a summary statistics, but it's actually a lot harder problem to solve. <laughs> yeah, the, the reason that, <laughs> the reason that is hard is because certainly a single user can actually impact uh, uh, multiple articles uh, of their ranking, right? So when you are taking, remember that going back to the uh, definition of differential privacy, if you remove the data from this one single member, um, all of a sudden you're going to see a lot bigger impact um, across different rankings. So that's why it takes uh, spatial algorithms that we have to, we have to build ourselves. And going to the system aspect, um, it's also, we wanted to make sure that we are able to apply this differential privacy uh, in a scalable way as well, um, that is flexible with regarding different data applications. Uh, so uh, we have also been building our own uh, system that is able to uh, keep the budget, um, is able to manage the privacy budget, at the same time being able to uh, be integrated in different applications that we do, things such as uh, uh, machine learning models, uh, such as uh, 
the um, um, the analytics that we do, the the APIs that we build, that we share data externally. So uh, with that, I'm actually gonna uh, conclude my talk today. I know that we went through a lot of things pretty quickly. Uh, just wanted to add a, like sharing with you all uh, that we certainly have a lot of, hopefully that have given you a breadth of the problems that we work with. I know that we did not have the chance to go deep in every one of them, uh, but certainly welcome you to email me directly. And my email address is uh, just my full name at LinkedIn.com that if you uh, are in, like, interested in knowing any of the problems in more depth, and certainly welcome you all to uh, uh, come and work with us as well. Uh, I also have uh, left a uh, email address, data science recruiting at LinkedIn.com here. So uh, welcome you all um, to reach out to us uh, through those channels. And if you wanted to learn more about entry level opportunities at LinkedIn, we also have uh, careers.linkedin.com slash students, that is, particularly designed uh, to engage with students. Um, and if you wanted to learn about just data science and engineering uh, more and uh, like and uh, a lot of the, the breadth of the problems that we solve, again, engineering.engine.com slash team slash data slash data science. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Polo because I uh, wanted to make sure that we get the chance to go over some questions as well.